Hi, this is Mike Stryko at the Devers Eye Institute in Portland, Oregon, and I'm excited to talk to you about my latest DMEC technique. This technique features DMEC tissue that has been pre-stripped, pre-cut, pre-stamped, and pre-stained, and pre-loaded into a DMEC injector at the Lions Vision Gift Eye Bank in Portland, Oregon. I start my surgeries by marking the area for the incision for the paracentesis and the main wound. I like to make one millimeter paracentesis. I then fill the eye with a cohesive viscoelastic such as Helon. No dispersive viscoelastic should be used as it can interfere with DMEC graft attachment. I then make my main incision with a 2.4 millimeter keratome when I'm doing a DMEC triple procedure. The cataract surgery proceeds with the usual technique. The only modifications are that the capsular rexus should be a little smaller than normal to maintain stability of the intraocular lens during the DMEC portion of the surgery. Additionally, as I mentioned previously, it is important to only use cohesive viscoelastic in your cataract surgery as dispersive viscoelastic will interfere with the attachment of the graft. To achieve dilation, I use phenylephrine 2.5% three times preoperatively. I do not use any cycloplegics as I need to be able to achieve a small pupil later in the case. I also do not use preoperative NSAIDs as these can prolong dilation, which is not a wanted effect in a DMEC triple procedure. I do like to use a retrobulbar block in these cases as I find it is very comfortable for the patient and it also gives a good and reversible dilation. The cataract surgery itself proceeds in a usual manner. I do find chopping techniques to be useful when working through a small capsular rexus. I have sped up the speed of the video for the cataract surgery for reasons of brevity for the video. I inflate the capsular bag with a cohesive viscoelastic to prepare for injecting the intraocular lens. I recommend use of a hydrophobic acrylic intraocular lens. Hydrophilic lenses have been reported to have calcification when exposed to air or gas in some cases. After lens insertion, I like to remove all of the viscoelastic from the eye so that I can achieve good pupillary constriction and know that there's no more viscoelastic behind the intraocular lens. Next, I inject myocol to bring the pupil down. I prefer myocol to myostat as its effects are shorter lasting and less likely to lead to posterior synechiae. I then refill the anterior chamber with a cohesive viscoelastic and perform the peripheral iridotomy. I use a bent 30 gauge needle and a peripheral iridotomy tool I designed with Storrs Ophthalmic. This tool has a groove that you can run the needle into to help make the iridotomy. It also has a bulbous tip that will not injure the posterior aspect of the iris like a sharp tool could which can cause bleeding or disinsertion of the iris root. I scratch down on the tip of the tool and then use the two tools to stretch the hole open. This stretching action is probably sufficient for creation of a PI, but I then enhance the peripheral iridotomy with a pair of micro scissors. Disposable micro scissors can be used, but I prefer to use the reusable scissors from microsurgical technology. I like to make two snips towards the periphery of the angle and then to remove a small portion of tissue to be sure that I remove some pigmented portion of the iris and have a fully patent peripheral iridotomy. Next, I want to mark the area of the desmetorexis. In cases of Fuchs corneal dystrophy, I generally mark an 8 millimeter zone of resection. In Fuchs dystrophy, the central area is the area with the most dysfunctional endothelium, and the peripheral endothelium is generally fairly healthy. This is not so in pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, where they may benefit from a larger graft size. I then use a Terry reverse Sinsky hook to gently score along the area of resection. It is very important not to engage the stromal fibrils. It takes a light touch as you do not want any rough areas at all in the bed that you're creating for the DMEC graft. Obtaining a smooth posterior stromal surface and then avoiding any overlap of the graft with the recipient decimase membrane has been shown to decrease the risk of graft dislocation and graft rebubbles. This diagram illustrates what I feel is the appropriate layout for a DMEC surgery. 
the red areas represent the incisions, and the yellow area represents the area of the decimase scoring. The blue area represents the DMEC graft and shows that there should be no overlap with the host decimase membrane, nor should there be overlap with the incisions. Friedrich Cruz was the first to report the importance of avoiding overlap of the DMEC graft with the host decimase, and I cannot thank him enough for this contribution as it has helped me and my patients immensely. To remove the dysfunctional decimase membrane and endothelium, I use the Salus stripper paddle. This was developed by Chris Salus when he was a fellow of mine at the Devers Eye Institute, and he is now an attending physician at Cornell University in New York. It is an ingenious device as it helps to remove the decimase membrane without disrupting the posterior corneal stroma. Next, I like to enlarge the main incision to about 2.8 to 3.0 millimeters. A smaller incision can be used, but I do not like to struggle to insert the DMEC injector. I remove the diseased decimase membrane with the Strico twin ring forceps. Forceps are ideal for atraumatic grasping of the decimase membrane. It can also be used for any residual tags of decimase that may be still adherent. I then remove all of the helon from the anterior chamber. For about the last eight months, I have been using DMEC tissue that has been pre-stripped, pre-stained, pre-stamped, and pre-loaded into the Strico DMEC Jones tube inserter at the Lions Vision Gift Eye Bank in Portland, Oregon. The tissue comes loaded into a Krollman viewing chamber, and the DMEC inserter and tissue can be removed with a hemostat using a second instrument for counter pressure on the non-sterile external surface of the viewing chamber. You can see here through the microscope view of grasping the Jones tube with the hemostat gently and elevating it from the viewing chamber. It is then attached to the syringe, which is filled with balanced salt solution and has a pre-cut section of 14 French catheter on the tip of the syringe. It is best to insert the tube sort of obliquely into the diagonal cut on the 14 French catheter. Next, the protective blue cap is removed from the tip of the Strico Jones Demec tube and discarded. After attaching the Strico Demec injector, I like to rinse out some of the Optisol from the injecting tube into the petri dish full of balanced salt solution. Generally, the graft is freely mobile and you must take care not to eject the graft. However, in this clip, I show how to deal with a graft that is adherent to the wall of the Strico Jones tube injector. If gentle aspiration and irrigation of the fluid is unsuccessful in dislodging the graft, I use a 27 gauge cannula on a 3cc syringe of balanced salt solution and I inject through the ostium of the tube to gently dislodge the graft. I cannot emphasize enough that these are very gentle motions so that you do not irrigate the graft completely out of the injector. And there you can see the graft is now freely mobile inside the Strico modified Jones tube. I like to advance the graft so that it is near the tip and ready to inject. I also observe the conformation of the graft so that I optimize my chances of injecting the graft right side up, which makes the case much easier. The way that I accomplish this is observing the conformation of the graft in the tube. What you want to see is that the V-shape is anterior in the tube, and once the graft is injected into the anterior chamber, it should be injected in the correct graft orientation, which minimizes the manipulation that's needed later in the case. If the V-shape is not found to be anterior, the Jones tube is simply rotated within the incision until the graft is right side up, and it is then carefully injected into the anterior chamber. Prior to injecting the graft, I inject myocol to constrict the pupil and do one more round of irrigation and aspiration to remove any viscoelastic or fibrin from the anterior chamber. When injecting the graft, it is very important to take your time and use very fine controlled movements to gently irrigate the graft into the anterior chamber. If at any time the anterior chamber is becoming overpressurized, it is important to decrease pressure through a paracentesis such as this. Failure to do so can result in ejection of the graft. I then block the incision with a cannula and remove the injector. I then set about unfolding the graft as I have detailed in other videos. 
In this video, you can see that I'm using two cannulas to rotate the graft to position the S-stamp superiorly. Occasionally, there is more edema around the area of the S-stamp, and I like to have it in an area of maximal graft support. I also like to rotate the graft perpendicular to any corneal folds, as I find it is easier to unfold. I generally use two cannula techniques, such as this, to gently unfold the graft. If I'm having trouble unfolding the graft, I pay attention to the depth of the anterior chamber. If the anterior chamber is too deep, tapping movements are ineffectual in unfolding the graft, and if it is too shallow, the graft can be trapped by the iris. I then pay attention to fine centration techniques, as I have detailed in other videos. And once I'm satisfied with the centration of the graft, I'll lock it in place with a 20% SF6 gas bubble. When injecting the gas bubble, it is important to maintain the eye in primary position and to have the cannula positioned as central as possible. Failure to do so can result in decentration of the graft. After locking the graft in position, I reinflate the eye with balanced salt solution to bring it to a normal intraocular pressure. If this step is not completed and only gas is used and no balanced salt solution, I find that gas can be trapped behind the iris and it is important to have the eye at a normal pressure prior to adjusting the final size of the gas bubble. After the graft is fully locked in position, I like to make sure I have a suture in the main incision. This can be done alternatively prior to positioning the graft, or a suture could probably be omitted, but I like to be safe and place a suture in the main incision. This prevents any loss of graft support should the patient happen to rub their eye. After the graft is securely in position and the suture is tied and the knot is buried, I like to elevate the pressure to approximately 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury for about two minutes. I feel that this helps to promote adhesion of the graft and prevent graft detachments that may lead to rebubbles. Following that two minute timeout, I adjust the size of the bubble to approximately 90% of the anterior chamber and a normal intraocular pressure and I ensure that the bubble will not block the peripheral iridotomy. At this point, the case is completed and the patient is sent to the postoperative recovery area where they will be examined in approximately one hour to make sure that there is no pupillary block and the bubble is freely mobile and the peripheral iridotomy is open. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it informative. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at the Devers Eye Institute or on my YouTube channel. Have a great day.